Good evening. I want to welcome all of you to our Libertarian Town Hall, where we will be presenting three presidential candidates for your consideration. I'm Harold Thomas. I'm the state chair of the Libertarian Party. I want to especially thank uh, Jansen A. Williams, our Montgomery County Coordinator, and our state vice chair, Helen Gilson, for organizing this event. It seems that every four years we have somebody say, this is the most important presidential election in our lifetime. It has become a cliche in American politics. The truth is, you don't know how important a presidential election is until a few years later when you can assess the impact of the president that got elected. But what I want to emphasize here is we have three candidates that present a strong alternative to the duopoly. That's what we call Republicans and Democrats because they conspire with each other against everyone else. On the one hand, we have a president who is a dictator wannabe, who's actually turned this country into the dictionary definition of fascism. Fascism being a system that is authoritarian, unfairly favors big business, is highly militaristic, and is highly authoritarian. And on the other side, we have a party that seems to be taking a race to the bottom to see who can come to communism the fastest, even though they're politely calling it socialism. We know that neither of these are acceptable alternatives. Neither of them protect the freedoms that we asserted in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution and neither of them present desirable alternatives for the American people. That's where our candidates come in. I would like to encourage you to think about the criteria that you want to see in a presidential candidate, and I'm going to suggest two. The first is, are they true to the libertarian statement of principles and platform? Now, if you're not familiar with the Statement of Principles, I'll give it to you in one sentence. The essence of our principles is this, that no one, including government, has the right to use force for social or political ends. That's it, non-aggression principle. The second thing I would like for you to consider is which of these candidates is most likely to attract voters who are not libertarians. The average voters out there, the independents, the people who are disenchanted with the two duopoly parties, because we need their votes. Yes, you can argue that maybe the chances are a little uphill for libertarian presidential candidates but we have to get as much support from them as we can because this is how we will grow and this is how we will protect our ballot access. So with that in mind, I would like to now introduce our vice chair and organizer of this event, Helen Gilson. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. 
I also uh, want to tell you about someone that is key to tonight, and that is an individual that I first met uh, when he was delivering yard signs to me during the Johnson Wealth campaign. He pulled up in my driveway and gave me 10 of them and told me to give them to somebody. So <laughs> I want to welcome Matthew McGowan up to the stage. Matthew has, <laughs> Matthew has uh, been a stalwart libertarian for a long time. He has uh, been writing about politics and veterans issues, employment issues, and sports for a couple of decades now. And he also has been a elected uh, candidate, uh, libertarian official in Cheviot as city council. So we thank him for actually having run and be, be, been elected as a libertarian. And we thank him for being our MC tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Um, on behalf of everyone at Think Liberty, I want to thank the Libertarian Party of Ohio for inviting us to participate in this event. Um, just a couple notes for everyone. I am going to introduce the candidates. Um, as I introduce them, they're going to come to the stage. They're going to give a introduction of themselves. And after which, we will start with questions that have been submitted to this forum. Each candidate will have three minutes per question. All candidates have been provided with five rebuttal cards to where if they would like to answer another candidate's response, they can put down their rebuttal card and they will have one minute to rebut. Um, so without further ado, we drew straws to determine the order of candidates this evening. And it is my privilege to introduce to you Ken Armstrong. Ken brings more than 40 years of military and government experience to his campaign, which happens to be more than any president-elect save one in the last 40 years. He and his wife have been essentially living out of their car as they crisscross the country, meeting with as many libertarian voters as possible. Ken, thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really do want to thank the uh, the uh, LPO for staging this event, to Harold and especially to Helen for all of the great work to make this happen. I also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my wife down in the front row, Dawn, and, uh, and my, my uh, road manager, Earl Schenk, uh, who have really been instrumental in keeping me as sane as I could possibly be, which is questionable uh, for this time on the road. We've been on the road now for four months. And we came into this, as most of you know, virtually unknown in the Libertarian Party. And it has been very gratifying. I mean, I, I have to say honestly in the very beginning that what we got was pretty much crickets when we would send uh, emails out to the state party chairs and tell them we were coming to their state and would they like to meet. And, and, uh, uh, and then a little magic happened in Ohio. And since then, we haven't looked back. It has just been fabulous. It's been very gratifying that uh, uh, we're getting invitations to all of the debates, the state conventions, and all kinds of events. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's fun to see the Libertarian Party at work and to, and to be uh, recognized and welcomed in the party. I want to talk a little bit today about the issues that are important to me. And because of what's going on in the news right now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Iran. Uh, first of all, if we intercede on the behalf of another country, against a country, that is by international definition an act of war. And we invite things that we may not be ready or willing to accept. I'm very concerned about the rhetoric coming out of Iran right now, and I'm interested in diplomatic solutions to what's going on, and particularly 
a full and fair investigation into what Iran says is really not their doing at all, and they claim to have pretty hardcore evidence that that the attack on Saudi Arabia was not theirs. So the question is, and, and I just want to make this very short and sweet, but do we want to jump into another foreign war when we're not even sure of the details and we're not sure what the objective of that war would be? And do we want to intercede on behalf of Saudi Arabia, who is perfectly capable of interceding on their, to acting on their own behalf, uh, is the implication there that young Americans are more expendable than young Saudis? So I just want to leave that question sort of hanging in the air, because I think the libertarian answer to that, the non-aggression principle, is, as uh, Harold talked about, is really the answer to so much of what's going on in the world today, and the failure to abide by it is, the, is what has created so many of the problems that we're facing. Uh, I want to talk also about the economy. The economy is probably the number one threat to our country right now. We have a president who promised to pay off the national debt in eight years, who has taken us now 10% deeper in debt in less than three years. That's the biggest existential threat to our children and grandchildren that could possibly exist. And I think that the libertarian answer to that is smaller government, balanced budgets, and efficient and effective administration of the public trust. I also have, I'd like to talk to you about immigration, and we'll have conversations about that in the future, but I had an interesting conversation with Larry Sharp over dinner a couple of weeks ago, and Larry proposed the idea of having two Ellis Islands, he calls them, on our southern border, and I want to announce that we've developed our own plan that would add an international free trade zone to the southern border and incorporating Larry's idea of the two Ellis Island concept in the international free trade zone and changing the visa laws to make them fair and workable so that we don't have people who are trapped in the United States forced to violate the visa laws, uh, which uh, if you look at the 2014 statistics, which is the last full statistics we have, um, the 42% uh, of all of the undocumented uh, people living in the United States at the time were visa overstays. So that's a big place where we can uh, uh, handle our immigration issues. Health is probably the biggest conversation in the other two parties right now, and neither one of them offer an, a, a solution that gets us out of the hole that we've dug ourselves into. I'd like to propose that the Patient Bill of Rights in almost every state says that you have the right to be involved in your own health care decisions. And yet, federal law doesn't really allow that to happen. Uh, I would propose that people have an opportunity to select the health care model that they want, including uh, Chinese herbal medicine, Native American medicine, uh, naturopathy, any, any of the other options of medicine that are available and to open medical solutions to international free trade so that pharmaceuticals and other things that are available overseas can be available at the same cost to Americans. Those solutions would drive down the cost of health care significantly and make the issue of ensuring health care a much more affordable issue to all Americans rather than using the solution that government always uses of driving the costs up through government administration. So I want to thank you for being here today. I hope that, uh, that we have an opportunity to discuss some issues at length. I'm looking forward to your questions and, uh, and a, a good discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right, our second candidate Soraya Foss is a former 2016 independent presidential candidate and is the first woman of Arab descent 
the first Armenian Catholic, the first millennial, and the youngest candidate in the history of the United States to run for president. Soraya is a community activist and has been an educator for nearly 20 years. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Soraya Foss, and I'm running for president because I'm one of you. And it's really hard to see when you have all the other candidates are talking about empty promises and not being realistic as to the everyday issues that are going on and the possible solutions that they can bring into place. I bring in diversity. My family's from Aleppo, Syria. Um, I'm Armenian Catholic. My mom was raised in Venezuela. One of the things that I have that nobody else does is the languages. And that's something that's gonna be able to help me communicate with a lot of people. Among the firsts, I was also the first presidential candidate to be invited to the General Assembly meeting of the United Nations. Not everybody has that opportunity. To be able to meet with heads of states, I've already established a relationship with a lot of presidents and foreign ministers of other countries. And it's very important, especially with what's going on nowadays around the world. When it comes to foreign policy, that's something that really hits home for me because of the diversity. My family experienced a Holocaust. People don't realize that the Armenian Holocaust is actually the first Holocaust of the 20th century. And till today, the fact that it hasn't been recognized, it allows for countries like Turkey and Saudi Arabia to continue persecuting Christians and minorities throughout the region. I understand and I sympathize the Israelis over the Jewish Holocaust, but you don't, re you don't see the Armenians playing victim all their life. There's no reason for the United States to continue contributing. I understand they're allies of ours and we can support them, but not financially. It's hurting us at home, not just with Israel, but these wars that we are waging on other people's behalfs. What is it that we're doing? What are we gaining out of that? We're putting our children's lives at risk. These are our tax-paying dollars that we shouldn't even be paying that are going out to fight those wars that aren't even ours. As an educator, I can tell you when I first went into education, realistically knowing that I was gonna go into politics, I've taught over the 20 years, Catholic school, charter school, public school, and private school, because I wanted to know what I was talking about when it came to education. And it's really sad to see how the children nowadays are being brainwashed. Yes, I said it, brainwashed. We have all these fundamental groups like Saudi Arabia, who brought down our Twin Towers and are to blame for 9-11, it's mind-boggling how is it that we have the President of the United States calling them allies and trying to negotiate arms deals with them. And not just that, it's, again, on whose behalf he's willing to put down the blood of our children for the sake of, uh, I don't know what to call it anymore, greed, self-interest, is it really about the patrol, you know, the, the oil? Is that really what it's about? I mean, he ran a whole campaign in 2016. He was going to put America first. Unfortunately, I have yet to see that. And if you guys want to elect a true candidate that is one of you, that is really going to put America first, that is what I can promise you. Because I am one of you. I am not rich. I don't have a famous last name. My family migrated from Aleppo, Syria, to upstate New York and Utica. My dad worked in a factory. He washed floors at St. Luke's Hospital. I am a product of the American dream. And all I can tell you is that I don't want to see that dream just wither, like it's, like it's happening. Now, when it comes to immigration, nobody can talk about immigration more than I can. I've taught people citizenship preparation. Those people that have truly struggled the legal way to come to this country. It's sad to see how is it that we have people that are coming in nowadays that have more rights than we do as American citizens, whether it's free tuition, whether it's health care. And I really don't understand how is it we've allowed this country to become a freebie. You know, it's a free for all that everybody can just come in and think that they can trample on everybody else that's already been here and has been here the legal way. We do have to set boundaries and whatever laws that we have in place have to be equal to everybody without discrimination. I come from a very conservative family 
And being a faith-based person, my religion has taught me to be able to, to be accepting of all religions, to be accepting of every sexual orientation, of every gender, of every race. That's what I can tell you is that I'm not a career politician. I went into politics because at 14, I was told I'd make a good politician's wife and I couldn't be a politician because I was a woman. Do you know what I told him? I was a son of a prominent fundraiser, um, head of the fundraising for the Democratic Party at the time for the Clintons. I told him, I said, do you want to bet? I told him, I'm going to stay right here. I don't need no daddy contacts and I'm going to prove to you that I can do it. And you know what? I did. I made history like he said. Among the firsts, I can tell you that it's not about just getting into a position. People don't realize what is a politician. We've lost the essence of what is a politician. A politician is supposed to be of service to the people. You guys don't realize you have the power to keep those people in office. You don't like them, you can fire them, and that's going to take your vote. I was, I was a Republican my whole life, and in 2016 when I ran, I ran as an independent because I wasn't happy with the two-party systems. I didn't have to change my party affiliation. And my whole, the whole time I was a Republican, I was always involved and I was always a libertarian at heart. I'm a big Ron Paul and Ron Paul, Ron Paul supporter, and I was always a part of the Florida uh, Liberty Caucus as well. And I can tell you, I really got to see the hypocrisy of the Republican Party. When I ran for Congress against Carlos Corbello, someone who they hated, they called a rhino and everything. And to think that I got nearly 18% on my own grassroots, and it wasn't just on my own, no, it was the people's support. And that's what got me there. Because to me, it's not about the money, it's about you. And without you, I wouldn't even be standing here or even be thinking about running for president if I didn't have your support. Because to be honest, I'm not going to be giving out free ponies or pineapple pizzas. I don't wear a big hat on my head, okay? But I can tell you that I'm doing this from my heart. We need somebody who's going to be president that's going to unify this country. And when I came into this party, it wasn't just to run for president because I'm, this was a lifetime decision for me and commitment. I want to be able to unify the Libertarian Party. And because of my diversity, I already met with certain people in Houston who had provided Previously, literature in Spanish. I'm looking to do a commercial. I speak Arabic as well. You guys don't realize, and it hurts me to see, when you have people that are running for president under the Libertarian Party to tell you, I'm running to not be your president, okay? We have a lot of candidates who are taking away from those who are truly wanting to do it for the right reasons. And I don't know if it's just me, but I know there's a lot of you that are sitting in the audience today who see the potential that I do in the Libertarian Party. When you have 52 to 55% of the Americans who identify themselves as independent or non-party affiliate, those are the people that we need to reach out to. And if we get those people on our side, you guys don't realize we become a majority. And it's gonna be the majority, and this is the time, and it's this coming election that's gonna make it happen. Because every presidential election, we see it. Everybody's tired of the two-party system. They're tired of the empty promises that people are doing. And when I ran in 2016, I said it and I keep on saying it again. No matter who gets elected, nothing changes. Whether it's a Republican or Democrat, and it's time to get a Libertarian in office that's going to show them how to get things done. Thank you. All right, and our third candidate, Vermin Supreme, is a highly respected political satirist who has been raising the curtain on the political process for over 30 years. A social media phenom, his audience transcends politics, making him arguably the most recognizable libertarian politician to the average American voter since Ron Paul. Vermin? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Vermin Supreme. I am from the internet. 
It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am indeed seeking the Libertarian Party nomination for the presidency. Um, many people might be wondering, and I run into this question, Vermin Supreme, what are you doing here? Why are you running for president? What, what is going on? Why, why are you messing with our Libertarian Party? And uh, I hope to be able to answer that question here uh, uh, briefly if I can. Uh, and so I think I should best start with a brief uh, autobiographical sketch, if you will, uh, and uh, talk about my uh, understanding of activism, how I became involved in activism, and how I became involved with the Libertarian Party. I've been uh, running for uh, president for some 30 years. I've been vermin supreme for over 30 years. Um, I became vermin supreme in uh, Baltimore, Maryland in uh, 1986. Uh, I was doing bookings and promotions for several nightclubs, and um, it wasn't that unusual for uh, people in the art weirdo scene or the punk rock scene to take on uh, different names. And so I took on Vermin Supreme because all club owners, all booking ag agents were vermin, and I was going to be the Vermin Supreme. It was a short leap into politics, and all politicians are vermin, and I am the Vermin Supreme. Um, I, I first decided to uh, run for office, mayor of Baltimore, Maryland, in 1987. Um, once again, it was a lark. I had uh, no political reason to be saying that or doing that, but because I had been running the nightclubs, I felt I had uh, reached a large number of people and had become a, a figure that uh, that was an interesting enough project to keep me there. Unfortunately, it was not enough to keep me there, and I left Baltimore. And the reason I left Baltimore, uh, because the Great Peace March for Global Nuclear Disarmament uh, came through. That was a march uh, in 1986 that came from Los Angeles, California to Washington, D.C. to uh, protest nuclear weaponry. Um, when it arrived in Baltimore, Maryland, it was 5,000 people strong. Um, I had been led to the believe that it was no longer a march, but uh, I found otherwise. I went down to Memorial Stadium and I saw 5,000 people there marching in unison to make this political statement that uh, nuclear weapons are dangerous and, and should be banned. Um, I was so inspired by seeing this amazing setup, uh, 5,000 people and the infrastructure that was required to move such a thing down the road. They had kitchens, they had porta potties, they had uh, uh, porta potty pump trucks, they had uh, schools because they had uh, hundreds and hundreds of children uh, with them and they were continuing their education. Uh, they had trucks pulling people's belongings. It was a sight to behold and I found it to be an amazing mode of protest. So I went to a thrift store, I picked up a cheap sleeping bag, a change of clothes, and join this march uh, to DC. Uh, this is where I uh, first started meeting a bunch of uh, activists, anarchists, um, who were uh, believed that this was a very potent and powerful way to uh, make a political statement by uh, getting uh, such a group together and uh, marching in this fashion. And uh, so uh, a group spun off of that uh, and uh, became the Siege of Peace. They were able to obtain a kitchen, a uh, trailer and uh, a water trailer and some porta potties and they decided that uh, they were going to continue uh, helping move uh, peace marches down the road and so I joined this group this small hippie scum collective and uh, began uh, marching for them um, and of course this was a, a very important and uh, formative time for me um, and I became to get a political awareness um, we walked from Kings Bay, Georgia, where they were testing the Trident D5, where they were deployed the Trident D5 missiles down to Kings Bay, Georgia, where um, they were testing the Trident D5 missiles at the time. There was um, dis civil disobedience. People were invading uh, Cape Canaveral in an attempt to uh, shut it down, and that was my introduction to to activism. Um, then I met my wife on a peace march in Michigan, and we began traveling around the country. Uh, living out of a small vehicle and uh, attending different uh, events. Uh, the Nevada nuclear test site, uh, the Cape Canaveral test site, and we were helping uh, various communities and peace communities and activist communities uh, around the country um, learning these things. And um, during this time, I, I learned uh, my skills as a, a nonviolent activist. Um, back in the day, of course, at these giant political actions, it was very important uh, to do peacekeeping and uh, make sure that things ran smoothly. And uh, as such, uh, I became a, a nonviolent uh, direct action uh, teacher and teaching uh, how to do direct action and how to maintain uh, your nonviolence. And uh, that dovetails so nicely into the, the NAP that I, I found it 
uh, incredible in, in that. Uh, also, at this time, as I was traveling the country, I started attending uh, the National Rainbow Gatherings, the gatherings of the family, uh, Rainbow Family of Living, Love, and Light. It's a gathering of 10, 15, 20,000 hippies in the woods uh, living in a, without any uh, government interference other than the uh, massive police presence they, they put in there to stop it. But essentially, it's an anarchistic organism where we live in the woods. Um, a, a quick example, it's, uh, imagine if you will, 4,000 people uh, in dinner circle waiting for dinner. All of a sudden, a hundred different kitchens in the woods send down five-gallon buckets of food down to the main circle. Everybody gets fed. During this time, uh, the magic hat gets passed because it's a non-commercial event, and uh, that's the only place you can give your money is to the magic hat. So everybody kicks in a voluntary contribution. That money goes to the banking council. Banking council counts that money, announces that it's total transparency. The supply council they meet with the supply council. The kitchen council sends down the representatives of these hundred different kitchens, decides what they need uh, in terms of shopping. They give it to uh, the supply. Supply takes the money from banking. It's repeated every day uh, for several weeks. Um, miles and miles of water pipe are laid down, um, and this event occurs with no leaders, no one in charge, and if anything happens, it's because we get together and form councils that will get this done. So this was uh, my introduction to anarchism. I consider myself a uh, rainbow anarchist, if you will, because I have seen it and I have lived it and have a great understanding of it. Uh, the Rainbow Gatherings, uh, meanwhile, I started attending, uh, started also giving me a national network, meeting people from all over the country. Um, we also started attending the national political demonstrations, which also started uh, meeting people from across the country. At this time, I was also bringing in uh, my f uh, imaginary political campaign, running for this or running for that. At the Rainbow Gatherings, I also was able to learn to be a clown. I was able to, for several years, I was able to push the limits on what people might think was funny. And I learned to like push the limits and have a lot of fun and be funny. And also continue my stage presence and uh, hosting um, talent shows and the like. And so there's that. And after a few years of that, I realized that another very important function that we uh, presented to ourselves and provided for ourselves was security. Because you can't have a, a gathering of 10,000 people without some level of security. And we provide our own security. And we get together, and we are Shante Sina, which is some sort of Sanskrit cultural appropriation for peacekeepers. And uh, we provide our own security. And it was uh, at this time that I also started bringing in my clowning uh, into security issues. And another one of the uh, services that we provide is uh, providing uh, escorts to the media and the police. Uh, so I found myself doing an eight-hour shift walking police through this crazy rainbow gathering, uh, trying to keep them out of trouble, trying to smooth things off between them and the, between the, and the cops, um, while propagandizing the police and trying to explain to the police what they were seeing and what they were experiencing. And I would walk uh, eight hours with uh, half a dozen uh, Alabama state troopers. and. Um, and uh, yeah, they would chill out. And it was very interesting to see them calm down and understand what's going on and, and rip the buttons off their uniforms to give me at the end of, the end of this thing. And uh, so then it was a short leap to bring these clowning skills, this running for president skills, out into riot world. And I became, uh, I started to develop a, a, set, a technique and a set of uh, skills uh, that allowed me to bring clowning into very intense uh, situations between police and protesters where there is this vacuum where anything could happen and oftentimes it does. But I found that I could step into this vacuum and with my bullhorn and with my peacekeeping skills uh, defuse some very intense situations. And by bringing in my clowning, I was able to release tension and have fun with the cops at the expense of the cops and rehumanize the police in the protesters' eyes and rehumanize the protesters in the police's eyes. And so these were things that I was doing and it was uh, this organic, building upon um, skill set that I was uh, learning how to do my craft. I started attending the uh, New Hampshire primary up in 1992 and, and uh, claiming that I was running for president, wearing a boot on my head, and, and doing these things uh, that the media was super, super interested in. And so I started manipulating the media and uh, messing with the culture by presenting this, this character and uh, this, uh, this mythology and, and the, the free ponies and the mandatory toothbrushing laws and all of these things. But these things had such an amazing resonance that the simple effort, the simple act of wearing a boot on my head, something so simple, so elegant, but so incredibly effective, it had allowed me to increase and multiply my First Amendment free speech voice millions and millions of times. Um, 
Now, of course, uh, my first uh, meetings, I guess, uh, of, uh, of the libertarian movement probably happened around uh, 2008, I think, uh, when uh, Ron Paul was uh, running for president, and he was up in New Hampshire, and that was the first time I got to, uh, the opportunity to shake his hand and uh, ask him straight up if he supported mandatory toothbrushing laws. And Mr. Ron Paul said, yes. And I asked Ron Paul how he was going to pay for uh, this, this program, and he responded to me by printing lots and lots of money, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny and, and totally in character for him. And uh, so uh, then I asked him finally if he would go back in time with me and kill baby Hitler, and he said that sounded rather risky, and he drove away. Uh, but that, that, that was very, very exciting. But that was where I first met uh, Liberty activists in, the, in New Hampshire during the primary, where I met some of the original Tea Party before the Tea Party was hijacked by the Republicans, when it was still the Ron Paul activists who were wearing the tri hats and using that imagery. And uh, we found ourselves on the street, and there's this restaurant uh, in, called the Merrimack, where uh, they used to film Crossfire and other things, a place where all the politicians would go. And uh, one night, Frank Luntz, the pollster, was holding a poll, and he had all these people spinning dials while they were watching a debate. And uh, myself and all these uh, activists uh, found that if we banged on the windows loud enough, we could affect the results, because the, the needle would jump. And I also found that if I used my bullhorn and pressed up against the glass and, and said something very loud, that could also make the needles jump. And so I realized that these, these were some people who were rabble-rousers on the streets. Um, and then in 2012, um, I went viral. I was uh, running the Democratic ticket, and a few, a few quick notes, uh, you know, I was running, uh, been in the New Hampshire primary, uh, hijacking that international media, hijacking that national media, and uh, Making a making a a, rock, a a fool of myself, if you will, uh, in order to propel my narrative. And in 2012, I was uh, participating in the lesser known candidates debate in New Hampshire, and um, that's where I introduced the mandatory toothbrushing law to to America on C-SPAN. That's where I introduced the idea of the free pony job creation program and the federal pony identification system. Um, and it also also where I glitter bombed Randall Terry, the the terrible. Uh, homophobe and uh, abor anti-abortion activist. Um, but I went viral and, and um, millions and millions, literally millions, six million, ten million views on, on, uh, on YouTube. Um, literally, the, I was interviewed or, or referenced or uh, talked about in any and every media source. And I became a meme. Uh, my likeness and image was used to propel um, any number of things. I would put words on. And um, I became an, an incredibly well-known figure, and uh, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, also in 2012 um, was Occupy the Primary in New Hampshire. It was the last of the Occupy move, uh, movement things, and uh, they were having Occupy the New Hampshire Primary. Uh, the thing about New Hampshire, it's really nice because it's really small, and uh, all the activists know each other. And so you have activists from the left, uh, the Occupy the New Hampshire primary, and then you had the activists from the right, the whole Free State project. Um, and we would meet together, and there was no animosity, and we met, we went, we shut down Newt Gingrich. We shut him down uh, coming together uh, to do this sort of thing. Also in 2012, I was at the Ron Paul Fest in uh, Tampa, uh, where my friend Chow Hound from the, uh, back from the Seeds of Peace days, when I was doing peace marches, he became a, a mucky muck in the security detail there. And he was driving me around, and he was amazed at how I was able to fluidly uh, move between the, the left and the right, and activists of both. In 2016, uh, Mr. Boomer Shannon uh, from California reached out to me and started communicating, and uh, we were talking about doing a fundraiser for the uh, Los Angeles Libertarian Party, and uh, the, uh, I was called out by Hollywood, and uh, so I was out there anyway, and we made this happen, and we had a fundraiser where I was the guest, and we raised uh, several thousand dollars for the uh, Los Angeles uh, party. And uh, it was also that same year when Trent Solms of the uh, Youth Caucus um, reached out to me and invited me to the International Students for Liberty Conference. Uh, and I was, uh, went on stage and I introduced the president's uh, introduction and gave a lesson on pononomics. And uh, that was very spectacular. And um, so let me say I've attended eight uh, Libertarian State conventions in the past uh, year and uh, I have been going there and th there are several points that I'm trying to make. 
Many people know me from the internet. They think they think I'm the meme. They think I'm a character. But I've been going there to show them that no, the boot is not surgically attached to my head. No, I am not my character. No, I am not always on. I am not a disruptor always. Um, I am a very reasonable man, and I have a very reasonable offer on the table. Um, and I think that uh, when you get right down to it, uh, I think many people will uh, understand the pragmatism that I believe that we may be able to harness uh, my viral image, my viral character, my viral campaign, and uh, turn it into the gold standard for the Libertarian Party, 5%. Thank you. Can you have a seat? Um, I would like to take a moment to thank these three candidates. Um, Anybody who's ran as a libertarian can tell you that it is really hard to run for a local office, much less the, much less the office of President of the United States. It is a tremendous strain on not only your finances, but your family and indeed your sanity. So the fact that you three thought enough of the Ohio delegation, um, it warms my heart. I'm sure it does for everybody here in the room. And I would like to personally thank each of you for attending. So without further ado, we are going to jump into the question segment of this forum, and we are going to start with Ms. Foss, and then we're going to go in a continuing order based on the original statements. And our first question, so one of the things that's a, a big challenge for the Libertarian Party across the country is ballot access. As a veteran of the ballot access wars here in Ohio, I can tell you it is something that I never want to go through again and I didn't have the level of involvement of a lot of people here in the room. Um, so the question on every Ohio voter's mind for our presidential candidates, how will you get us 3% or more in the presidential election? Ms. Foss. Well, first of all, again, it's that I bring in the diversity and I can appeal to a lot of people who I can tell you now just running um, from state to state, meeting everybody, and talking to everyone, not just the libertarians, but just the average citizen. There's a big misconception happening, I guess you'd say a language barrier, especially among the Hispanics, between what is a libertarian. A lot of people seem to think it means um, liberals. The same way how, um, again, teaching citizenship preparation, a lot of people that are fleeing socialism and communism coming to this country, when they become citizens and they come to register to vote, because they're seeking democracy, they seem to think that Democrat is democracy. So I think before anything, what we need to do is we need to educate people as to what it is that we're about, about our platform, about our policies. And a lot of people will realize that they're truly libertarian at heart, the same way how I was, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, at the end of the day, being a libertarian means we bring forth, you know, the ability to push our individualism, the fact that we can be ourselves without having other people interfere as to what it is we're doing daily. So I can tell you that me being able to reach out, not just the media, because I did a lot of the media in the home language as well. I speak Arabic. I understand Italian and French as well. I'm, being, I'm gonna be able to communicate being young, being a woman, and having that diversity. We're gonna appeal to a lot of people. And again, it goes back to the fact that I am one of you. I have no interests other than truly from my heart wanting to make a difference and being able to unify, um, you know, not just the party, but the country together. Because everybody else, what they've done is just divide and um, it's just been division and, um, it's really sad to see that, you know? So I think that's how I'm gonna be able to do it, is reaching out to the masses and doing what I'm doing now, going out there and meeting each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Supreme, yes, what will grab. you do to ensure we get the 3% we need to retain ballot access? Can I grab my water over here real quick and take a sip of that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. It's your time. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. Well, I, I believe that uh, if I am the nominee in May, um, I will have a huge head start on the whole process. We'll only have six months to ramp it up to all sorts of craziness. Um, I come at you with a, an audience of literally millions of people who know me. They teach me in the schools. Um, the kids love me like a, like crazy. I can only tell you. Let me let me rattle this off to for you. 3.9 million high school students uh, graduate in any given year. Give me two of those years. Give me the class of 19 and 20. That's 8 million people approximately. Add that to the 17 million college students in college in any given year. That's a pool alone of 24 million young people. If I were to get one out of four of those young people to vote for me, that will equal the 6.5 million that equals the 5%. Now, once again, that does not include the huge, huge collection of uh, subcultures that I hope to tap into that fall under nerd geek cultures, everything from roller derby girls to crypto nerds to anime nerds to Comic-Con nerds to uh, kinky sex nerds. Um, all across the board. There are so many um, subcultures across America that fall under that nerd banner, and they are my natural base. Um, so I believe that the, through the sheer force of viral marketing um, that I stand a very good chance of bringing in that uh, 5%. I, I believe we can do it, and I believe we can do it together. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong. What would you do to ensure we get our 3% required for ballot access in Ohio? Well, of course, uh, uh, looking to Ohio, but also looking to the nation, uh, the bar is a little bit higher nationwide, 5% as opposed to 3%. <clears throat> I've really already started doing that. Uh, my campaign so far with Earl and Dawn and, and my faithful Duke, the Wonder Dog, we've traveled by car to 35 states in the District of Columbia in the last four months. We have met with people like David Thoreau of the Independent Institute. I've sat and had dinner with Larry Sharp in New York. But we've also met with a lot of ordinary people on the street. And they're really, you know, it, all politics are local. And unless we get involved with people at the local level and really hear their voices and really find out what's important to them, talked to, to a woman at a shopping center here in Ohio a few months ago, and the issue that was most important to her was that the state and her local school district couldn't afford to provide the, the special education needs of, of her child. And the main reason for that was the unman uh, unfunded mandates from the federal government on the state requiring so many resources that there, there weren't resources left for her. We don't learn those things unless we talk to the people on the street, unless we really get to know what, what real people are looking for. I'll just say what caused me to jump into the campaign, the seminal event that caused me to jump into the campaign, was during the government shutdown, when Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross said he didn't understand what the problem was with all of these unemployed people. Why wouldn't they just go get loans? And that was a, a symptom of an out-of-touch government, of a dilettante leadership in government. And we really need to be talking to the people on the street. So I'm already doing that. And I think as we connect with people on the street, as we show them that libertarians really hear their questions and really have solutions that are viable for them, we connect with the population in a way that even if they haven't checked the L block on their party registration, that they realize that we are, in fact, the people that they want representing them. Very good. Thank you. Okay, next question. We will start with Vermin Supreme. How do you propose to build the party so that we can be a larger factor in national politics? Uh, once again, it goes to my uh, my audience base. It's a young people. I, I test very, very highly in the uh, young people demographic. Um, all those subcultures, I believe we can tap into, and I believe that my fans will enjoy it indeed. Uh, join the Libertarian Party uh, to vote for me because uh, that's their best opportunity to support me as a candidate. Um, in fact, uh, we were at the uh, Comic Con uh, a couple weeks ago in New Hampshire at the Granite State Comic Con, and uh, I split, the, I shared my uh, merch table um, and campaign fundraiser table with the uh, Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. And uh, we met and we talked up the party, and uh, we were able to uh, increase the membership of the uh, New Hampshire Libertarian Party by uh, something like 15%. 
Um, we, we got a whole bunch of young people signing up on board, and uh, I am following up on that with uh, letters to them, you know, from Vermin, uh, giving them a little thumbnail sketch of, uh, you know, what the Libertarian Party is and, uh, and like that and welcoming to that. So I, I believe it can be sort of a, a secret club. Um, now, I'd like to address one of the main concerns that I believe that, that people have about uh, a Vermin Supreme uh, candidacy, and uh, can a, a serious party put up who a, a person perceived to be a joke candidate and not perceive, be perceived a joke party? And I believe that it can. I believe it's totally in the framing, and I believe it can be framed very simply with a statement that says something to the effect that we are the Libertarian Party, we have uh, very valid ideas, we have very serious uh, visions, and we do a lot of stuff, and uh, all of these things. This is who we are. Are. However, the duopoly presidential system has become and risen to the level of a joke, and we're putting up vermin supreme. Ha ha ha! Screw you. I think it could work just like that, and I think it would give the Libertarian Party uh, enough coverage that they were in on the joke. And so then, when anybody said, ha, ha, "He's a joke," uh, the LP could say, "Well, yes, he is. He's our joke." F you. Thank you. I'm vermin supreme, and I believe that I could grow the party. Thank you. This actually, we're going to go in the, yeah, we're going to keep going in the roundabout order. So, Mr. Armstrong, how would you propose that we build the party so we can be a larger factor in national politics? I think the, the number one issue facing us internally is understanding our brand, understanding what libertarians really are and really aren't. We're, we're a broad spectrum of approaches but we're really a, a narrow spectrum of targets or ideas. We want less government control on our lives. We want the government to take less or preferably no money out of our pockets by force. These are things that we can agree on as a party. If we start understanding our brand and if we start putting up candidates who can be the banner carriers for that brand, then we can unite behind those banner carriers, if you will, and, and we, can, we can start leading the public to understand what it is we're really about. Because we don't grow the party without reaching out to the public. We, we don't grow in a vacuum. The public has to, has to feel welcome and invited to what we are. Thank you. All right, Ms. Foss. How would you propose to build the party so that we can be a larger factor in national politics? Well, I've already started um, hosting town hall meetings. We're going to have one in Florida, uh, in Miami on October 8th, where everybody is welcomed. And they can meet with local um, elected officials that are libertarian. People can voice their questions and concerns, and they can register and sign up right there. At the same time, you know, again, we're looking to target the bilingual communities and the minorities, and just to tell everybody that the Libertarian Party is welcoming to everyone. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about unifying everybody. I also started um, approaching people, whether it's in the high schools and the universities, why is it we don't have a libertarian club? They have a Republican club. They have a Democrat club. So to start those clubs, get the children active, and that way they can volunteer and participate in the campaigns, especially at the local level. And um, again, it's just educating people, making, raising an awareness. At the end of the day, it's about all of you, and it's not just going to take me to be able to do this. We all have to come together, and there's a lot of factions within the party. I think that's where we have to start. And I can tell you right now, I'm not going to mention names, but I do have a lot of people who are committed that are already supporting other candidates that say that if their candidate doesn't get the nominee, that they would be supporting me. So that's a start. Great. Thank you. All right. You actually brought up a very important point um, that's on the minds of a lot of our voters here in Ohio and across the nation. Given the factionalism, not just within the United States itself, but especially within the Libertarian Party, what will you do to unify people so that you can achieve the goals of your campaign? Mr. Anderson, we're going to start with you. Or Armstrong, I'm sorry. Apologies. I always think of Ken Anderson being a Bengals fan. <laughs> That's okay. That's that's a, a that's decent name to be associated with. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Apologies. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. Right. Uh, you know, what we're really about as libertarians is respecting individuals, and sometimes I think we forget that. But the 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 big trick to uh, um, to getting people 
uh, to, to, get, to get out of conflict, if you will, is to get them to talk to each other. And I'm a Jeffersonian in, interna in international relations, but I'll apply that internally. Jefferson, in his inaugural address, said that the United States should be at peace with all nations, be at commerce with all nations, and strive to be friends with all nations. And you know, if, if we can, can create a, a conversation where we're doing life with the people in our community instead of opposing them, where we listen to them instead of sit there and wait for them to shut up so that we can make our argument. Um, and if we encourage similar dialogues, and again, all politics are local. We're focusing today on the presidential race, but it's very important for us to go all the way down the ballot to the town councils and, and uh, those races because it all begins with listening to people at the local level and teaching them through our ability to listen to them, teaching them to listen to each other. That First Amendment right to free speech is your right to offend me. That's what that's about. It's, it's not my right to say whatever I want. It's your right to offend me. And if we embrace that, that we have these freedoms, and these freedoms are great when we exercise. And if we learn to have conversation with, it, with each other, where we open our ears instead of just waiting to, to, to throw up our, our dialogue on people, uh, I think we do a lot to overcome the animosity that's going on in the public place. Okay, thank you. Ms. Foss, we're, we're actually going and we're going to continue going in this order. So given the factionalism, as you had mentioned and referred to, what will you do to unify the people so that you can achieve the goals of your campaign? Again, it's talking to everybody, trying to find that middle ground, what it is that we can agree on and work with what we can agree on and not necessarily focus on the differences. And that's how we're going to be able to move and to grow as a party united. And I can tell you, you know, when I ran in 2016, I ran as an independent. I had from the most conservative of the Republicans to the most liberal of the Democrats. And I had a lot of libertarians supporting me as well. And just to think within the few months that I've had a chance to meet the other candidates, I mean, I was able to get Dan taxationist stuff to not wear his yellow hat on stage. And look, we have Mr. Supreme also without a booth on his head. And you guys can actually listen to them and realize that what they have to say, not all of it is about jokes. We don't need to wear big hats on our heads to get the voice across to others. What we have to do is we have to come together to be here among one another and to be able to find a middle ground. What are the things that we agree on? And start there. And that's how we're going to be able to build our party. Thank you. Mr. Supreme. Yes. I am a uniter, not a divider. Um, I, when I did my uh, viral stint in 2012, when I became famous on the internet, because it was a nonpartisan, perceived to be a nonpartisan presentation, it was embraced by people across the political spectrum. And as such, I have an existing fan base from the far right to the far left. And that's always been the case, and I've always known uh, that uh, the anarchists on the left and the anarchists on the right, uh, they are my supporters. And I always know that, uh, you know, if they weren't voting for Ron Paul or they won't, weren't voting for Kucinich, they were probably going to vote for me. Um, when I was at a, an event, I was attending one of my college speaking uh, gigs in uh, Pennsylvania at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, at the time, Hillary Clinton was in town giving some sort of rally. I was walking down the street, and I saw this, uh, this big... Uh, group, this table with the Trump banner and all these Trump kids, and I also saw next to them was another group of about 20 or 30 uh, Antifa black and red kids. And so I walked up to those groups and both of them were shouting in unison, excited to see me, hey vermin. And I was able to introduce them to one another on the street, you know, what normally would be extremely conflicting uh, factions. And uh, so I do have a experience, and I have a, the pre-existing uh, ear of, of people on all sides. I mean, even at the straight pride parade uh, just a few weeks ago, as I was taunting them, uh, trying to rebrand it as douchebag pride, um, there were those inside that parade who knew me, who were fans, who were communicating with me. Um, and that, that puts me in a slightly awkward position sometimes, let me assure you that. 
Um, but in, in the, also in the Libertarian Party itself, uh, um, I have a, a very wide fan base, and I've been welcomed into the Libertarian Party with open arms in ways that I could not have ever even imagined. Uh, my campaign staff it has been amazing. I never would have imagined that I would have actual people with real libertarian campaign uh, uh, experience uh, trying to run a campaign and help me get the nomination. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, I've been making inroads into the pragmatists. They, they can see the pragmatic reality of my candidacy as one that is possibly and likely to bring in the percentage points that we need. And we need to put these, uh, you know, these differences aside, these differences that, that divide us, especially the, the hot button topics. I mean, uh, I think in libertarian circles, you're pretty good if you're down with about 80% of the platform. You're not going to agree with some of it, but you have to be open-minded enough not to be rabidly against that 20% that you disagree with, and you can't be slagging your, your friends because they don't agree with that. And uh, I believe that uh, I have shown that, and I will continue to demonstrate that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Oh. my first rebuttal if I could absolutely and I'd like to use it to not rebut excellent but to to point out we've got three candidates here with very different perspectives on what it would mean to be the libertarian candidate for president but this is the beauty of our party I had dinner with with vermin tonight and uh, you know you may be surprised to, to hear it from me but he's really a, a, a wonderful guy and I look forward to getting to know Soraya better, but this is it. What, what Soraya said, what Vermin said, what I said, talking to each other, that's the solution. And I think that's what our party is really all about. Okay, very good. Okay, our next question, we are going to lead off with Ms. Foss. How will you appeal to non-libertarians? I don't know, it kind of sounds like the same, but well, <laughs> again, um, it's a diversity. That's what I bring in, the ability to communicate. I am an educator, so it's listening to them, finding out what are the common grounds, how it is we can come together, what are the issues that we disagree on, and try to find common sense solutions for them. Okay. Thank you. Berman Supreme. Oh. How will you appeal to non-libertarian voters? Um, I believe that I do already appeal to non-libertarian voters, and in my vast uh, constituency portfolios, uh, ultimately, really, libertarians are, are but a small part of that. Um, and I believe that I can reach out. I, I believe the libertarians, of course, have, have a lot of uh, public relations uh, and perception problems. Um, before I even started working with libertarians back in the day, I had serious reservations and concerns. Um, but as a left anarchist, once I started to look at that platform, you know, I realized that uh, there was a lot that I had in common with the Libertarian Party platform. You know, I, I agree with the NAP, I agree with, with their, their statements against the police state, against the government, against government overreach, against uh, taking your things, all of these things that, that many Americans already agree with, they intuitively agree with, they know these things, but maybe they don't know that is what the Libertarian Party stands for. So I believe that I am perfectly positioned to bring forth these ideas and, uh, and correct these misconceptions of libertarians being greedy. I know I understand libertarians to be compassionate and I'm full of love. And uh, in 2012, when I was in New Hampshire, uh, my, uh, we stayed at my campaign headquarters at the time was Chris, uh, Chris Lopez up in New Hampshire. And uh, she uh, was paralyzed, but the community of libertarians joined together to help her uh, and help themselves and help her find a job and help her uh, prosper. And, uh, and she is still an extremely valuable member of the libertarian community up there. It was things like that that opened my eyes to what libertarian was really about and what could be about and what it should be about. And I believe that in my educational uh, capacity uh, as making these little uh, comedic uh, PSAs, if you will, and uh, bringing humor and dialogue uh, that I can make a, a never ending and endless series of, of info bites that we can uh, share with the American public and share with my audience base and to the people that already support me, that I already have a connection with. And I think I can bring them in our direction and uh, point out the sensibleness of our positions. Yes, I will bring po uh, ponies and zombies, but I have agreed that I will uh, focus on the po Libertarian Party platform. Those planks are the planks that I want to get forward because if I am the nominee, that is only right and fair that I present what our party is all about, and that is what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, how will you appeal to non-libertarians? 
Well, I think that's really what we're doing right now in our campaign. As I said, we've visited 35 states in the District of Columbia already. And, and you know, the thing that I have to remember is that Americans aren't blue or red or gold. They're people. They're people from a whole bunch of cultural backgrounds. They're people from different economic strata. And when we try to label them rather than hear them and hear their voices, that's where we end up running into trouble. I think what we see in uh, the duopoly, is, as Vermin refers to it, the, the two parties that are uh, running the country badly right now, is we see that they have packaged their message to pander to particular stereotypes of groups. And we're starting to see Americans in those groups resist the stereotypes that they've been packaged into. So we need to talk to real people about real issues, and we can't do that unless we get our boots on the ground, find out who they really are, and find out what's really important to them. Thank you very much. This, pre this question will start with Mr. Supreme. In 2016, Gary Johnson raised about $12 million with an additional million coming from outside groups. How would you raise that much or more towards a presidential campaign? Well, once again, such amounts, I believe, is generally a very hard thing to imagine, even conceptualize for uh, most of the candidates in this race at this time. And I believe ultimately would be uh, trying to harness the awesome power of, uh, of fundraisers and professional fundraisers and, uh, and the viral marketing. And I, I believe that uh, I might be able to do it for, for cheaper because we'll be getting all this uh, earned media. I mean, if I'm the nominee, you can expect a serious explosion of every media source in the world trying to figure out why in the world the Libertarian Party would put up a guy with a boot on his head as their nominee. And I believe that alone is probably w worth millions in uh, in free earned media, uh, if nothing else. Uh, myself and my campaign, uh, I am currently actively seeking the threshold. I'm not saying that we will take it if we meet that th threshold, uh, but the threshold that would allow one to uh, uh, obtain federal election matching funds. And uh, because I consider that low hanging fruit, that's $5,000 if you can get that from, if you can repeat that in uh, donations of less than 250 bucks in 20 states. Uh, the Federal uh, Election Commission will match that. Once again, it's not theft money. It's not tax money. It's money that people uh, voluntarily checked off. So that's a pool that I'm looking at, and uh, that's a start. Um, 100000 becomes 200000 and then every uh, dollar after that becomes $2 if what we were to go that route. Uh, but I believe there are indeed many uh, professional fundraisers. I believe that there are uh, many uh, wealthy donors that will uh, step up and uh, want to do it. That's the best I can do for you right now. But my, my, but my team is working on these things. We are working on papers, and we are looking uh, towards uh, preparing ourselves uh, in, the, in, the need, in the case that we do, in fact, get the nomination. We want to be ready for it, and we are currently uh, working out many of these uh, details and uh, bigger ideas and for bigger plans. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, how would you meet or exceed the $12 million raised by Gary Johnson in 2016? I got seven dollars in my pocket to get started with, That's if that'll story. help. Uh, one thing that we've discovered recently is that we're failing to tap some of the best possible resources for our party. I think we look at business leaders and uh, the baby boomers and so forth as the sources of capital in our party. And it is true that traditionally those have been good sources of capital. There's an interesting phenomenon that, that the, the millennials and submillennial groups in our country are actually much more philanthropic than you think they are. They just don't generally go toward traditional philanthropy. You see them being very generous at, at the very much grassroots level. And what we're doing now in our campaign is we're working to engage college students and, and people in that group and that generation to work among their peers to, to group source funds for the campaign. And I think we can raise quite a bit of money on small donations from generous millennials. And we will call upon one of those millennials now, Ms. Boss. 
Well, from somebody who has already ran for president prior, I can tell you it's not about the money. It doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, a race for who can raise the most funds. And I can say that I honestly appreciate and would rather have the support of millions of people, even if they just donate one dollar each, that'll amount to those millions of dollars. But in order for to do that, again, I don't want money from special interests. I don't want money from big corporations. Why? Because then you owe them something. And at the end of the day, you shouldn't have to owe anybody anything. Those that want to contribute to your campaign, it should be because they believe in you, they believe in your message, and they believe in what it is that you can deliver. And that's the reason why, to me, it's not a contest about who can raise the most money. It's about whose support you can bring in. And people's time and their dedication and knocking on doors and handing out flyers for you and staying late at night, you know, those are the things that count and those are the things that matter. And that's what's going to move us forward. It's that grassroots effort. I don't want special interest money. We can have millions of dollars. What does that amount to? What did, where did that take Gary Johnson? You know, at the end of the day, it's about the people. And that's what I want to keep it. Thank you. All right. We are going to start the next question with Mr. Armstrong. What are your honest expectations of your candidacy should you win the nomination? My honest expectations of my candidacy. I would like to see the Libertarian Party unite behind whoever the candidate is and give up the, the what we've seen in the past is that generally some group or other feels like they were defeated at the convention and they sort of fall away until the, the next round. I would really like to see all of us unite behind whoever the candidate is and obviously I would like that candidate to be me. Ms. Voss. What are your honest, honest expectations of your candidacy should you win this nomination? Well, honestly, I don't think, or at least I hope, that not every single candidate that enters this race, that it's for popularity or it's just to get, you know, who can get the most uh, viral uh, things on social media. When you come into a race, it's a race to win. And I am being very honest when I can tell you guys that we have a lot of potential. And I see that potential. And it's not a potential that I can see that I can help you deliver that message or that we can get there. But if we do, again, reach out to those people who are independents, to those non-party affiliates, and to bring everybody and unify everybody together within our party, we will become the majority. And that's something that's realistic. And we can make it happen. And hopefully, I'll have your support. Mr. Supreme. If I were to be the nominee, I believe I would be in for six months of extremely hard, difficult, working, campaigning, media interviews, pressing the flesh, event after event after event after event after event after event. After event. And I'm willing to make that commitment. I'm willing to do a whistle stop or wh whatever it takes. But I, I am prepared to do that. I believe that uh, the day uh, if I were to be nominated, I would immediately call forth all the amazing, talented people who have been working on all the other campaigns. Because we have so many experienced uh, political operatives, people with experience in political campaigns, people with amazing ideas, hard workers. And I would want to bring them all together and, and make it happen. Make them the team and run our asses off. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will start this next question with Ms. Foss. And um, Mr. Armstrong kind of led into this. One of the biggest debates, as evidenced by the recent debate between Nick Sarwark and Dave Smith, is principles versus party. Would you support a libertarian candidate if they did not meet your standard of libertarian yet won the party nomination? That's a very good question. And actually, I was going to do one of my rebuttals when Mr. Armstrong touched on it, because we had done a podcast, and I had a few other candidates on there. And to my surprise, everyone said no. 
And I thought for a second, I said, oh my God, well, did I say something wrong? I mean, I don't understand. So then when it was my turn to talk, which is what I'm gonna tell you, is that I strongly believe and I trust in all of you that are delegates that you're gonna make that decision based on those principles, based on the party platform, and you're gonna find a candidate that's gonna be able to deliver that message and stand by, again, the principles and the values of what this, the Libertarian Party represents. So for me to say no, then that means I am being selfish. And I was the only one that said yes, and I will support whoever the nominee is, and I hope it's me. Thank you. Marvin Sabrine. Uh, well, once again, it's my general understanding that uh, most libertarians will understand that if you agree with about 80% of the party platform, um, then that's pretty darn good. And of course, probably not everybody agrees with every last darn thing. Um, so there is that. I mean, you, you, there is, you can't make your purity test so pure that no one will pass it. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, if we're looking at, uh, you know, somebody outside the party who wants to come into the party and has some very strong beliefs that are totally uh, at odds with the, uh, some of the party platform planks and if they've been activists, especially in those areas, um, I would have some very serious thoughts. They, they would have to provide us with some assurances that they will uh, promote only the Libertarian Party platform and not their own pet takes on a couple hot button issues because that would be uh, pretty much uh, against what we're for. So, um, you know, I, I believe uh, politicians, it's, it's generally understand that uh, oftentimes they present the, uh, the uh, beliefs of their constituents and they're working on behalf of their constituents and they may not personally uh, even agree with the issue, but they understand that is what their constituents want. Uh, so these are my real politic uh, calculations on that question. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong. This is short and simple. I already know who the potential candidates are on the red team and the blue team. And the worst of us is better than the best of them. I'm with the gold team. Very good, very good. All right, moving right along. Should one of these other exceptional candidates that you alluded to, and we will start with Mr. Supreme, win the nomination, would you be willing to accept a vice presidential nomination? Herman Supreme. I guess. <laughs> there we go. Mr. Armstrong. How do you follow Furman, for goodness sake? <laughs> not fair. Uh, absolutely, you know that's not the target I'm shooting at right now, but like I said, I'm on the gold team. Whatever the gold team recruits me for, I follow the coach. Ms. Fox. I honestly didn't give it any thought. <laughs> But um, I would. Very good. I would, because at the end of the day, it's about helping strengthen the party and working together. So that's something that we should all consider. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, we are going to start with you for this question. Um, as so many of us learned the hard way in 2016, there is a very hard and fast 15% polling requirement to be included in the presidential debates. What would you do? to ensure your inclusion as the Libertarian candidate in the 2020 presidential debates? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I guess we have to run the best ground game that we possibly can and engage as many people as we possibly can in spreading the word. And, you know, as, as Soraya said, that goes well beyond just money. It goes to respecting people and to engaging people. Uh, the, the secret to our success is not going to be spending more than other people, so it has to be engaging people with a meaningful conversation. Very good. Ms. Foss, what would you do to ensure your inclusion as the Libertarian Party presidential nominee in the 2020 presidential debates? Well, you said it has to do about polling. 15 percent, that is the threshold. Yeah, I think we're going to surpass it if I'm because at the end of the day, it is. It's about being able to 
discuss the issues, being able to relate to everybody, and everybody's tired of the two-party system. So everybody's looking for a third option, and why not give them the best that you can? Very good. Mr. Supreme. Um, well, as I have said in the past, I am not out to troll the Libertarian Party. I am out to make an offer to help the Libertarian Party troll America. And uh, I believe that just my sheer, uh, the fact that I would be the nominee and I was out there and going to be on all 50 state ballots, I think that would create such an incredible buzz. I think it would be so darn viral and it would be, would be so darn irresistible um, that I would be, I mean, how could, I, how could America not want to see Vermin Supreme on stage with the other two clowns? And I believe that would get the 15%, just the, the sheer lulls factor. <laughs> I mean, D's nuts was polling at what nine percent for a while, and yeah, I, I think it would happen. It, and once again, that's the gamble. That, that's that's the gamble we're taking. That's the that's the offer that's on the table. You know, how much fun do you want to have in the next election? How much fun do you want to have running a candidate? Uh, it come May, uh, you will be faced with a serious question: Which timeline do you want to exist in? Very good. All right, we are going to start this question with Ms. Foss. And this is going to go to the nuts and bolts of the job that you're going after. How would you roll back our military involvement abroad while only minimally disrupting our trade and relations with friendly countries? Well, we shouldn't be there from the start. So I would just start calling back the troops on the countries that we know for a fact that there has stability, and not to mention the countries where we're causing the instability. And there's no reason for them to be, you know, risking their lives and, again, fighting wars that aren't even ours. The United States should not be calling other countries or choosing to say that they're allies. The United States is supposed to be the brother and sister of all the other nations. I mean, we're one of the largest and the most powerful nations in the world. Why is it that we're choosing favoritism? We're supposed to be an example, and to be that example, we have to lead by example. And the only way we're going to do that is by minding our own business. Why don't we got to start working within our own country? If we can't get our country, the homelessness altogether, you know, people working two to three jobs just to maintain their family, what are we doing? I mean, really. Are we putting America first? Again, going back to Trump in 2016, he ran a whole campaign that that's what he was gonna do, and I have yet to see that. What I would be doing is I would be focusing on our country, on our people, and uniting ourselves back to the principles that this country was founded on, that we've lost the essence. And you're gonna see that it's just gonna come together all on its own once we start focusing internally and start minding our own business as to what's going on on the outside. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Supreme, how would you roll back our military involvement abroad while only minimally disrupting our trade and relations with friendly countries? That is an extremely me hypothetical question, which I don't believe uh, I need to answer because I will likely never be in that position. I can only reiterate the uh, Libertarian Party platform position that we are against foreign intervention. We support uh, only a very minimal uh, defensive military, uh, that we support only enough money to re collect the intelligence that we need to keep America safe. So yeah, it would be a non-interventionist, um, minimalist uh, military platform, but uh, that's simply me regurgitating my understanding of the Libertarian Party platform and to speculate on uh, how I would personally do this, that, or the other thing without consulting zillions of generals and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a little silly for me to try and uh, pretend I have any expertise in those areas. Thank you. Fair enough. Mr. Armstrong, how would you roll back our military involvement abroad while only minimally disrupting our trade and relations with friendly countries? First of all, I believe in the Constitution, and it doesn't seem like recent administrations have paid much attention to it. On January 20th, 2021, I'm going to be standing on the western steps of the U.S. Capitol building to take the oath of office, and in my inaugural address, I'm going to tell Congress this. You have 30 days to declare war 
where you want war to be declared. And where you do not declare war, on the 31st day, I will recall all of the troops from that area. As to affecting our economic relationships, our trade relationships, I think most of our trading partners resent the way that we have been adventuring around the world and throwing our weight around. And for those few countries who, who want or need our protection, if it's established already in treaty, for example, as it is with Japan, that we help to provide protection to that country, we'll honor those treaties. But we don't need to put young Americans at risk for adventures. And on day 31 after my inauguration, we're bringing the kids home. OK, we will start this question with Mr. Supreme. Um, here in Ohio, as all across the country, really, uh, we're faced with a Republican governor who has told us how much he values and defends our Second Amendment rights while seemingly being willing to forfeit them under the guise of red flag laws. Neither the Republicans or the Democrats are standing against this vast encroachment on our rights. What would you do to repel the seemingly inevitable march of red flag laws across this country and their effect on law-abiding citizens who own guns? Vermin Supreme will take your guns and give you better ones. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist giving you a little bit of the uh, wacky humor I'm known for. Um, and that's, the, that's, that's, you'll get a lot more of that if I'm the nominee, of course. Uh, but uh, for this particular question, once again, of course, it is a gross violation of the Second Amendment. Uh, the Libertarian Party platform supports the Second Amendment explicitly. So all I can say is that we, would, we are, uh, as a party, and we are actively in uh, our various locations, working on that very issue to try and repel these, uh, these laws. Um, Myself, I mean, once again, I, I don't propose to have the solutions. Uh, I merely propose that I am the best candidate uh, that's going to get you that percent. <laughs> All right. Mr. Armstrong. And I will repeat the question. With the advance of red flag laws across our country and the unwillingness of Republicans and Democrats to do anything to stop them, oftentimes advocating them for them, what would you do as the nominee of this party to repel the advance of red flag laws? Well, I think we need to repel the advance of laws, period. So laws of, of any kind are kind of uh, against my DNA. Uh, Dawn and I, as a matter of fact, were just talking about the red flag laws last night. And I just think that overall, we need to stand against government overreach and, and government I'm sorry? Can I repeat it again? Yes, I can Answer. absolutely repeat it again. I don't know, again. I'm asking. <laughs> uh, I don't need, unless you need me to. No, no. Um, to be honest, I think the issue that we have, again, has to do with lack of education. It's ignorance, and people are afraid of what they don't know. So if we were to educate people on the reasons why we cannot have the guns taken away, and why we shouldn't. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not the gun, it's the person behind it. So we have to focus on the issues that are leading up to that moment, whether it's working with the children, whether it's you know trying to find out how it is that we can help people, because we can't take away the people's right to defend themselves should they need to. So I am totally against any laws, um, especially the red flag laws, because you just open the door a little bit, and then they're going to do is they're just going to continue on, and we're not going to have anything to be able to defend ourselves with. So to be honest, it goes back to educating people, and you'll see that people are not afraid of, you know, once they know how to use something, I, I myself am certified, and I can tell you that a lot of people would want to be too, once they realize that they're going to be able to defend themselves. Because you're going to do, you're going to call on people with guns to come and defend you whenever you have a problem. Nobody's going to be able to defend your family other than yourself. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Armstrong, you had mentioned overreach when it comes to laws. Uh, here recently in the news, we have seen the overreach and overreaction 
due to black market vape pens causing lung issues for certain users. Um, the government in its infinite wisdom has responded by attempting to ban vaping and it's happened in, in various states. What is your stance on vape bans and what would you have to say about that? I, I really love, uh, you know, the city of San Francisco uh, bans Happy Meals and the city of New York bans jumbo drinks and, and I don't see people getting any healthier because of all of those bans. I think it's a perfectly reasonable role of, of government as well as, as uh, nonprofit organizations to warn the public about health risks. But I think the public gets to make their own decisions. Very good. Ms. Foss, your opinion on the attempts to ban vaping across the country? I'm against banning anything because I can tell you that once you ban it, people are going to find a way to use it, whether you like it or not, and that's going to cause bigger problems because then what they're going to do is they're going to end up having something that isn't the real deal that's going to cause more danger than what would the device itself. I personally wouldn't use it. I've never smoked, and I can tell you that the larger corporations there's a lot of interests behind that because once you take away the vaping and then people are going to go into cigarettes, which is going to cause more danger. So at the end of the day, it's all politics and that's what they're trying to do by that, unfortunately. Mr. Supreme. Obviously prohibition doesn't work, um, but I also will point out that black markets are free markets. Thank you. Okay, we are going to begin this one with Ms. Foss. I'd like to, By all means, that sir. That brings up a point, and I don't disagree with Berman about black markets being free markets, but what I will say about that is when we drive things into the black market, we drive up the cost to people. That's uh, the same thing by making prostitution illegal. I'm not a big fan of prostitution, but by making it illegal, we created a huge underground network that is also the same net network that hides child sex trafficking and other things. So the black market is not the right way for Americans to operate. Freedom and free market is the right way for Americans to operate. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. <laughs> very, very good. All right, Ms. Foss. How do you propose to eliminate poverty in absence of government programs? Okay, well I can tell you it's by starting locally. Taking it back onto the nonprofit organizations, the local, uh, the state, to the private entities. Those are the ones that we see are making a bigger impact in helping people. Whether it's um, teaching them how to pr better prepare having more trade school opportunities for people because not everybody, you know, was meant for school. And I can tell you because I'm a teacher and you have different types of children, you have visual learners and, you know, so I think it's trying to find a way to help people by giving them government programs. What it's doing is you're causing them to be a slave to the government because that just kind of keeps them comfortable. Why should I have to work if I'm getting free money? at whose expense at everybody else's. So I think it's about helping people, educating them, trying to find trades so they can help better themselves, teaching them how to go to interviews, how to dress well for them. At the end of the day, education is gonna be the solution to the majority of the issues that we're facing today. Thank you. Mr. Supreme. A rising tide lifts all ships and Dead refugee children, I'm afraid, also. Um, but of course, um, capitalism has brought more people out of poverty than uh, any other system in existence. And I believe that uh, uh, we do have to look back to uh, the decentralization that, that we're hoping to uh, achieve, uh, the, the uh, community support, uh, communities supporting communities. 
Um, you know, back in the day, uh, people gave 10% of their income to the church, and the church uh, provided many of these services, feeding the hungry and housing the homeless and, and uh, charity hospitals and the like. And that system sort of uh, fell apart and fell by the wayside. Um, I have always maintained, uh, as a left anarchist, that the only way that we can disengage from the government is by creating and uh, making new systems and systems that are parallel and parallel systems and uh, systems that will provide the services that are uh, that the government is uh, is providing right now and if we can do that and we can show people how to do that and share with our generosity and caring and uh, compassion and all of these things uh, we will be able to transition away from uh, that type of governmental activity if we take care of the poor and show them better ways thank you Well, I think there's, there's two uh, <clears throat> distinct answers to that question. One is invigorating the economy. And I don't believe we invigor invigorate an economy by regulating it. I believe we invigorate a company by setting it free. You don't, you don't make animals healthy by putting them in a cage and, and feeding them a restricted diet. You make them healthy by letting them out and letting them run. And I think the, true, the same is true of an economy. Uh, in that vein, I think we do need to provide opportunities, but we don't need to provide opportunities as a government. We need to encourage popular action to, uh, to, to provide jobs to, uh, to young people, to, to, pro to open up trades and, and things like that. But beyond that, I'm a, I'm a Weinberg Fellow of Hawaii Pacific University, and that was an advanced program for nonprofit executives. At the time, I was the uh, executive director of the statewide organization of Habitat for Humanity in Hawaii, and I was at the same time the, the executive director of both of the Oahu affiliates. I have seen a, a, an organization that was dedicated to breaking the cycle of poverty, and it was done not with government intervention, not with a lot of government money. It was done by people coming up from the grassroots and helping each other. The, the concept of sweat equity, if you want a home built for your family, you put in 500 hours of sweat equity on somebody else's home. And yeah, the, just the, the community involvement. If we have that invigorated economy that we're talking about, that economy set free, allowed to run wild, there's so much more resource available to the average Americans who have great, great hearts for helping the people in their community. We don't need a government to drive that bus. Very good, very good. All right, we, are, we have come to our final four questions of the evening. So. I had to pause and mention that because this particular question falling to this particular candidate is kind of funny. Mr. Supreme. Yes. How are you different from the other candidates? <laughs> well, you know, I wear a boot on my head. And once again, it should be noted that I've always maintained that if I was just a regular guy and I did not have a boot on my head and I just wore a suit and I was ranting and raving on the side of the road, uh, no one would pay any attention whatsoever and uh, I would not be a thing. It's the fact that I wore this, these simple, elegant, and effective devices, the, the, a boot on the head, talking about the free ponies, which I introduced the uh, American political lexicon, um, using these very resonant cultural touchstones, toothbrushes and zombies and time travel and, and killing Hitler and uh, all of these things. Um, these are the fantasy uh, ideas. Uh, essentially, the, the Venn diagram. This over here is Vermin's imaginary campaign world. Over here, reality. And they've always sort of met a little bit in the middle, uh, but now they are uh, becoming more, more and more uh, meeting in the middle. But anyway, uh, obviously, um, I am a viral meme. I'm a viral candidate. Um, I have a super crazy reach across the political spectrum, across the internet, and I believe as such that I would be able to parlay that into a uh, viral sensation. I think it will go crazy wild with the kids. Um, and I think we have a real chance to, to build the party in a real big way with, the, with, this, uh, with this youth. I'm Vermin Supreme, the voice of a new generation. Uh. <laughs> 
Oh, maybe that. Was it, was it loud? Yeah. Oh, no? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. All right. Mr. Armstrong, how are you different from your fellow candidates? Well, I'm taller. <laughs> <laughs> Got a better hairdo. <laughs> Although sometimes I am tempted to wear a boot on my head when I'm trying to get media attention. <laughs> but you touched on it, Matt, when you introduced me. In the last 40 years, there has only been one president-elect who had more experience in government management, international affairs, and national defense than I have. That's just simply a fact that can be researched and proven very easily. I know what I'm talking about when I talk about these things. I have experience. I've done the job. Ms. Foss, how are you different than your fellow candidates? Well, again, I bring in a lot of diversity. I already have uh, the capability to reach out to the media, more so internationally because of the languages. I'm a woman. And again, I think I'm going to be able to appeal to the youth because I am a millennial. I am you know, young. And as an educator, I can find middle ground. I've also, I have the education to be able to say that I do know what I'm talking about. When I went back and I told you that I was told that I couldn't do it, which is I think something that I have that nobody else does, is the drive and the faith and the fact that I'm in this to win. I'm not in here for popularity. I'm not in here for, you know, um, the media ratings or whatever it is. No, I'm here for you. I'm here for all of us because at the end of the day, we have to work together to find that middle ground. And it's going to take both you and I to be able to do that. Um, in a year and a half, I did my bachelor's. I did political science. I minored in international relations. I got certified in Asian studies of the concentration in the Middle East. I did regional transgressional studies. I did Latin American comparative politics. I wanted to really touch all the bases to know what it is what I'm talking about when it comes to foreign policy. Immigration reform, again, I've lived it with the people. Having the, to be able to prepare themselves to know the struggles of what it is it took them to get to where they are today and just to be able to know that I, I helped a lot of people get there um, is very fulfilling and rewarding. Education, again, I can tell you about what works and what doesn't work just because I've been in education and I have that background of all the different types of educational systems. And I don't know, at the end of the day, it's gonna be up to you, not up to me, to decide. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will start this question back with Mr. Armstrong. You've all listened to each other. You all know each other reasonably so. What is your favorite thing about each of your fellow candidates on the stage this evening? That's actually pretty easy. I, I love Vermin's sense of whimsy. I love the fact that even in a world that is experiencing a great deal of pain and suffering that he is not unaware of, he's still able to make people smile. And I really appreciate that, Vermin. <laughs> Soraya, even easier. This woman has a huge and generous heart, and I appreciate that. Very good, thank you. Sarah? Well, I can tell you that this is the first time that I've met both of the candidates, and I was very impressed. I was very impressed to see Mr. Supreme without the boot on his head, and the fact that He's not a fantasy that he does touch on a lot of issues that we really need to take into consideration and to address. And I'm also, um, you know, I admire Mr. Armstrong for having that experience when it comes to the military and national security. And I think that's something, you know, if I do become the nominee, I would want to be able to work with all the political candidates, the presidential candidates, and to be able to see what are the different issues and what it is and why it is that they're running and to see how we can work together to strengthen the party again. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Supreme. Um, I will say that I've taken part in uh, several libertarian debates with a, a number of libertarian candidates. 
And uh, I, I believe that both of these candidates bring a great deal of gravitas, a great deal of experience, and a, a great deal of understanding uh, of the issues. And uh, that impresses me very much. Thank you. All right, Ms. Foss. What we're all wanting to know, how can the Libertarian Party win in 2020? Again, it's coming together, it's unifying. Um, coming to agreement, working together, all in one voice, and that we are one. We have to show everybody, first of all, that we're together in order to unify everybody else as a country. And I don't know, I just have a feeling it's gonna happen. I think that this is our year. This is gonna be our year, 2020, and we're gonna make a big impact, and we're gonna win this. Thank you. Mr. Supreme. How can the Libertarian Party win in 2020? Uh, once again, it depends on your definition of winning and uh, what your definition of success is. Um, I don't think we, are, we just have the resources to become the President of the United States. It's just, uh, it's not our time, I don't think. I don't want to pee on anybody's parade. But um, I like to define success by ways that we can succeed. And I believe that uh, it is not inconceivable uh, that uh, I could bring the party 5%. I do not believe that it is, is impossible. I believe that we could possibly set a target for uh, recruitment and growing the party. Perhaps we could say that would be 10%. And I believe that uh, perhaps I could do that. And uh, so if we were able to do those things, if we were able to bring in 5% in my world, that is winning. That is bringing us uh, the national ballot access that we need to continue winning and set us up for winning in the future. Thank you. Um, to be honest, it saddens me to hear that. Because again, I don't feel that all the candidates know the potential that we have. Because that just, it just gives everybody the reason to say, why waste a vote on the Libertarian? You know, and that's not what it's about. We're going to show them that our vote is going to count. And we're going to make it count this election. And that's what you guys have to think about. You have to stay positive, And you have to realize that we really do have the potential to make this happen. But it's gonna take all of us working together. Thank you. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Armstrong, how can the Libertarian Party win in 2020? I'm kind of ashamed of us, really. It just occurred to me that here we are in Ohio, and we haven't used one sports analogy in the whole evening. I did call, <laughs> I did call you Ken Anderson. You did. You did. Okay. Well, uh, so imagine the Toledo Mud Hens going up against the, the Cincinnati Reds, and, and you, 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 you know who's going to win because you know this year the Reds are going to win, right? Isn't that what we know? And yet, the mud hens bring a great deal of heart to the field. Everybody knows who the Toledo mud hens are, right? I hope you do. Any MASH fans here? Okay. Anyway, so the, so the mud hens take the field. Do they have a chance of winning? Any team that ever takes the field has a chance of winning. But one of the things that you have to do is you have to play your very best game and you have to capitalize on the failures and the missteps of the other guys. And I will tell you from what I'm watching right now, the A team on the other two sides is not all that impressive. And we really can play a good game if we put our best team in it and we play to win, the other side is going to make some serious blunders in, in 20, and we can capitalize on those, and we can win. Okay, last question before we get to the closing statements. Mr. Supreme, what makes you the best candidate to achieve these goals? I think I've covered most of the reasons. Cover them again. Well, once again, of course, I have a massive viral online presence. I have a vast fan base that stretches across the political spectrum. Um, 
I am loved, beloved by the left and right. Uh, I don't know any other candidate that is consistently called a hero or a legend or any of these things, uh, but they're throwing at me all the time. And um, I believe through the use of humor uh, and uh, creativity that we can uh, totally amplify our presence and amplify our voice and amplify our minds, and that if we put our minds to it, we can do anything. Thank you. Very good. I was sort of a cop out, but okay. Mr. Armstrong, what makes you the best candidate for the Libertarian Party? Fire in my belly, because it's not about what I know, it's not about where I've been. Those things are good, those are tools that I bring. But the thing that makes me the best candidate, I rolled into this campaign in May with no name recognition at all. Practically nobody in the Libertarian Party had ever heard of me. And we are mounting a serious campaign and a serious challenge for the nomination based purely on the fire in my belly. Thank you. Ms. Fox, what makes you the best candidate to carry the Libertarian banner in 2020? Well, it's obvious that I see potential in the party and, and you know, this whole race that nobody else does. The fact that I'm actually real um, and I'm one of you. And I'm in this because I want to really make a difference. And I think at the end of the day, that's what really matters. And that working together, we're going to get there. Thank you. OK, we've come to our closing remarks. And we will continue in the order that we have been. Mr. Armstrong. Well, we've had a chance to talk about a bunch of issues tonight. One of the things that I want to say that we sort of touched on, but it's very important to me. I'm not running against any libertarians. I will not be tearing liber libertarians apart in the course of this campaign. The job of the party in May is to pick the best possible candidate, not to pick the last person standing. So I'm, it's really all about presenting who we are and why you should be interested in letting us be your banner carrier, which is a huge honor for the number one job of service in the United States to be your banner carrier and, and to represent the ideals of, of the party. So I'm standing before you as a person who doesn't like the limelight, doesn't like politics, doesn't like most of the trappings of fame and fortune, but who really wants to be sincerely the person who serves the American people in office. That's why I'm in this race. That's what I bring to the Libertarian Party. And I really hope that as people get to know me better, they will see that I am really the person that they want carrying the banner next year. Thank you. First of all, it's an honor again to be here with all of you. And I want to thank everybody who put this together. This has really been wonderful. And all I want to say is that my campaign is a campaign by the people, for the people, because I'm one of the people. And at the end of the day, you know, we don't, you don't run a race unless you're sure in your heart that you have a chance to win it. And I, again, I see potential, and I know that working together, we can really make this happen. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you that when you vote, to vote your conscience and vote for the individual that you think is going to bring about not just represent the principles, but also, again, the values, something that we've lacked in this country and the respect between one another. And I really look forward to having your support. Thank you. Bourbon Supreme. Yes, I believe that I am the best candidate that the Libertarian Party can field for the reasons that I've mentioned. I believe, and my supporters believe, that the politics of respectability has been getting us nowhere. Uh, they believe that it is time for something new, for something that has never been tried before on such a level, and I am willing to cooperate with that fully. 
I am putting an offer on the table. It's an entirely unique new strategy to take. It is a gamble, but it is a calculated risk that I believe that we as a party may be willing to take. Come May 24th, you will be given a choice. Which time stream do you want to be in? A time stream where Vermin Supreme is the nominee for the Libertarian Party? Or some other time stream? It's the choice, it's clear cut, and I believe that I am indeed positioned with your help, with the help of all the talented people that we have in the Libertarian Party to bring that 5% of which is victory. Follow me to victory, people! Victory! Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Vermin Supreme. <laughs> okay. Well, on behalf of the Ohio Libertarian Party, I would like to again thank each of you for being here. This has been wonderfully informative, and I just, I can't say enough. I know how hard it is to get around the country, and you guys put your money where your mouth is and came out for the delegates of Ohio. So thank you very much. And this concludes our event this evening. So thank you all for joining us out there in the internet, and uh, good evening.